as, as you mentioned, uh, we are a sponsor, so come by our booth, talk to us, hear about the cool technology things that underlie uh, Roomba. Um, so we're a serverless company, uh, and serverless is a buzzword now, you know, more meaningless now even perhaps than cloud. They're pretty compete with each other. Um, but what I want to convince you of today is that at heart, the notion of serverless is not about the technology that we call serverless, but a mindset for choosing technology. And I want to convince you that this mindset can be adopted whatever your tech stack is. Um, and so the, the purpose of it is to deliver value to your customers, and you can do that in any situation. Um, it re does require recontextualizing your role in, in the te technology delivery process. Um, and that goes for anybody who's involved in that process, engineers, operations, security, QA. So I want to tell you about Roomba. Um, so at iRobot, we're fully serverless in production. We have no VMs or containers supporting our connected robots. Um, it's all AWS, it's all AWS Lambda, and about 30 other AWS services. Um, and we sell millions of robots a year, and we're now connected full, through the full Roomba line. Um, so we have a high-scale problem, right? Uh, and being serverless is incredibly powerful. And I want to tell you a story about Christmas Day. So Christmas is an important time for us. Not only is it the biggest selling season for iRobot, for most consumer companies, but uh, additionally, unlike all of our other selling points, like uh, Prime Day is big for us, uh, all of the robots that get sold between Black Friday and Christmas come online in about a four hour window on Christmas morning. <laughs> And it is, it is a massive wave of traffic. It's about 100x the, the baseline. And on Christmas Day 2018, so you, you can imagine that is, a, that is a very large event in technological terms. Um, in process terms, on Christmas Day 2018, we have a couple of people who do monitoring for us and one employee who is tasked with uh, taking any action. And the only thing that that person had to do is uh, increase the shards on the stream that filled our data lake. Um, even that is an automatable process. We could have done that and it would have been completely hands off keyboard. And it's hard to understate like how huge that is, right? That we can handle this as a non-event, that our engineers are home with their families on Christmas day. They're on Slack because they're interested in seeing what the numbers are because that's fun. <laughs> They've spent the entirety of December not doing game days, not prepping for operations on Christmas, but building features to ship in January. And so that's what serverless has given iRobot. And that has required us to be you know, completely serverless native. And the mindset there is the most important thing, which is when we approach a problem, we think about uh, the technology ownership involved. Because we use a lot of Lambda, but functions are not the point. Right? A lot of people talk about serverless as if functions as a service is the, the, the gist of it. Um, and functions are great, right? They scale transparently, they manage the runtime for you, they fit naturally with event-driven architectures. All of these are fantastic and useful properties. Um, but they end up being a small part of your overall solution. They're the glue between your managed services that are doing the bulk of the heavy lifting that's needed in any application scenario. Managed services are not the point, right? They're also great. They give you the functionality you need with less hassle. And we're fortunate to have them for so many different uh, um, uses that we have, databases, message queues, identity and access management. Of all the things I don't want to own, auth is number one. Um, we have it for machine learning. We have it for analytics. All of these things we can do. Um, you're not patching the servers they run on. You're not figuring out how to scale it for the, for the traffic that you need. Um, uh, without over-provisioning. And all of this lowers their operational burden significantly, right? That we run all of this with uh, just a few people. But that lowered operations burden is not the point, right? It's great to know that you can apply fewer operations resources, right? And out of that pool of people that you have, you can apply them more directly towards creating new things rather than running existing things. Um, and it scales mostly, the operation scales mostly with the features that you ship, with the complexity of the system, rather than the traffic through it. When we add, you know, when we double the number of Roombas, we haven't doubled the number of people. We haven't even, you know, added another person to that team. Uh, on occasion, you'll hear serverless referred to as no ops. 
and it's completely untrue. If you talk to anybody who's actually practicing serverless, a lot of operations work that you, that you do with a traditional system goes away because it's being managed by a provider. Um, but there's also new work that you have to do, like monitoring your provider. And there's standard existing things for around the code that you still own. Um, and so that saves you money. But cost is not the point. Sometimes, just sometimes, all like the entirety of what you're being asked to do is reduce the cloud bill. And serverless can often help you do that. Not every time, um, but most of the time. But in general, your cloud bill is only one part of your overall cloud cost, of which you know, the amount of time that people are spending on operations is another big cost driver, right? Um, and uh, while all of these are important and important aspects of serverless, they're not the point. Because technology itself is not the point, right? The reason that we're doing all of this, any of the things that we're doing, is in service of some business goal, right? Some customer value that you're trying to create is the point. And sometimes what you're selling is literally technology. But even if the product is technology, the value that you're creating for your customer is usually not technology, right? There's an old adage that people don't buy drills, they buy holes, right? That the evaluation of, of what they're getting is around how it helps them solve their problem. And if you think about iRobot, right? Well, we make robots. What we sell is not robots. It's not even vacuums. It's clean homes, right? Roomba gives you time back in your day to do the things that matter to you. And serverless is analogous, right? The whole point of it is giving you and your organization time back to focus on the value that you're creating for your customer. So if this te technology is not the point, how does it factor in, right? The point of serverless is focus, right? Serverless is a way to focus on customer value. And so the technology is in service of that. Functions let you focus on writing your business logic, not on coding the supporting infrastructure that delivers your business logic. Managed services let you focus on writing your functions, not on how you're setting up the database that you're using, right? Lower operations frees up people's time to focus more directly in creation of that customer value. Things like observ observability, right? We talk about reducing um, or making better the directions, and I always get confused about mean time between failure and mean time to resolution, right? We want both of those metrics to get better. Um, they're both measures of how often your customers aren't getting value, right? When your system is down, your customers aren't getting that value, and you want that to happen less often and shorter times when it happens. And so this focus is the why of serverless, right? You, sh you should want to go serverless uh, because you want to focus on creating customer value. And at your company, you're charged with applying technology to the creation of that value. So if we go back to cost, right? Earlier this year, Lyft's $100 million a year AWS bill uh, was in the news, right? And a lot of people chimed in to say, oh, I could do that cheaper. First of all, no, you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you could, right, um, would Lyft's bill and their ability to focus be better if they went completely serverless? Well, at the end of that process, sure. It would probably be cheaper and it would be, uh, have, it would go down less often, all of those things. But what happens in the time that they're re-architecting? At that point, they're losing focus, right? And so that's where, at the point they are in their journey, executing with their current processes is more important than re-architecting to save cost. And so that's the serverless choice for where they are. Right? So what I'm telling you is that serverless has never really been about the technology that we call serverless. So where does that technology come in? It's a consequence of this focus, right? If you take that focus and say, I'm gonna take it to its logical conclusion, what is my technology gonna look like? Right, as uh, an analogy, right, dev and ops teams have traditionally been separated with the notion that they had different focuses, right? And the whole DevOps thing is that that's changing. That the traditional model put the focus on technology. It said, well, the things that operations people do and the things that 
developers do are different, so they should be on different teams. But we now recognize, oh, well, they're both creating, they're part of creating the same value for the customer, so we should bring them together and focus them on the features that they're creating and build the teams that way, right? And so uh, with serverless, when you wanna focus on value, you wanna write functions. When that function needs state, you need a database. So you're gonna go find a database as a service. And you wanna choose between those options based on how well it lets you focus, right? And when you're choosing these services, some of them may even be user facing. So social login, right, is a way of saying, I'm not gonna build my own auth system. I'm not even gonna you know, choose an auth provider and own my own accounts. I'm gonna let all of that be delegated to Facebook and Google um, or GitHub. Uh, now, of course, in all of this, for everything you're outsourcing, you're still accountable to your customers, right? If, if your system is down because of a third party outage, that's still your problem to your users and you need to own that. Right? And you can do that while still accepting that you don't fully control your own destiny. And this is really important. You know, you can, uh, so with these things, you can't win points. You know, nobody chooses something because it has a great login experience. Mm -hmm. But people avoid things because they have bad login experiences. And so you need to recognize what good looks like. And this is part of, you know, you can outsource the implementation, but you can't outsource the product ownership. So you need to know what quality looks like for your users, even in those areas where you don't, you don't know how to build what you're delivering there, right? But you do need to know what your users want to see. And so in this way, serverless is a trait. It's a trait of companies. If a company uh, chooses that it doesn't want to own technologies that aren't core to the value that it's delivering to their customers, it's a serverless company. And few companies are truly serverless across the board. But that doesn't mean parts of the organization can't be serverless, right? If a team decides that it's going to work to only own the technology that's core to what it's delivering to whatever its customers are, whether those are actual end users or other teams within the organization. Um, and the way that it outsources the technologies that aren't core is ideally to outside the organization, but that's not always possible, right? The constraints can say, well, that has to stay inside. But if it's another team inside the company, that's again in a serverless direction. And if you're a big enough company that it may cease to matter, right? When Amazon.com uses AWS Lambda, that's serverless, even though in some sense it's on-prem, <laughs> right? Um, and so, uh, but what if it's, you know, not even possible for a team. You come here today and you're buying what I'm, what I'm saying, but you feel completely alone in this at your company, right? What if you're patching servers for a team that serves a team that's creating user-facing content? So what I wanna convince you of is that you can go serverless yourself today in whatever situation you're in. And this is sort of where my talk turns into like a motivational speech. <laughs> um, because serverless is a direction, not a destination. Um, I like to think of serverless now as a ladder. Um, I used to call it a spectrum because there isn't really a fine, you know, a bright line dividing uh, something that is serverless from something that is not serverless. Uh, but what I like about the ladder is that it implies movement. You're climbing to some nirvana where you get to deliver pure business value with no overhead. Um, but every rung on this ladder is a valid serverless step. So if you move from on-prem into a public cloud, that's a rung on the serverless ladder. If you move from VMs to containers, that's a rung on the ladder. If you move from no container orchestration or custom orchestration uh, to Kubernetes, that's a rung on the serverless ladder. But there's always a rung above you and you should always keep climbing, right? So one thing that ladder doesn't convey is that it's, it, that it's not linear, that there often isn't a better, it's not like there's one step above the other. So if you're, on-prem and VMs, what's better? Moving to public cloud VMs or moving to containers while staying on-prem? Those are both the right direction to go and one of them is not you know, explicitly better than the other. And so I sort of thought you know, many paths leading up a mountain, um, but what I like about the ladder is that it's infinite, there's no top, there's no mountain top, there's no end goal that you reach to. So you know, 
being fully serverless, we use a lot of AWS Lambda, but we're always looking for ways that we can better deliver code with less overhead that helps us focus better. So for us, this has meant, you know, we built some orchestration things in Lambda and then AWS step functions came up and that helps us do that with even less code and more focus, right? So serverless is a state of mind, right? It's not, it's about how you make decisions, not what your choices are. Every decision is made with constraints, but if you know the right direction, you can choose among the available options, the one that most closely aligns with the best, the direction that you want to go. And then when you're making those choices, you're moving up another rung every time. So how do you adopt this mindset? How do you make serverless choices? So to start, as Ryan Holiday says, ego is the enemy. A big part of truly embracing the serverless mindset is a change in how we operate as engineers, as technology builders. Depending on how we construct our identity, if we identify with the technology we work with or that we produce or that we're used to, this may be difficult. It also involves, to a large degree, an acceptance of a lack of control. And that requires us to be humble. Because tool selection should not be driven by people, it should be driven by values. And this is important because you're not the tool, right? Any tool or technology that you're using is an enabler for you. But it's time that we, you know, we split the tool creator and the tool user, right? So that the tool user can focus on using the tool to deliver value upstream, and that a tool creator can spend their time focusing on how to make that tool better to enable the tool user, right? And this is things like making builds self-service. So that instead of uh, a, a building, you know, the team that owns build infrastructure, instead of delivering the builds themselves, delivering self-service infrastructure to create builds so that the teams themselves are responsible for delivering the builds. And so jumping into serverless, um, the decisions to make about um, what you're choosing, right? When you think about, okay, I wanna learn serverless, you bring a lot of your existing experiences uh, to, um, to this, uh, to the situation. And you end up choosing things like, oh, there's a framework where I can run existing web apps that I've built inside Lambda. And the problem with that is that, sure, that helps you get off the ground, but it's not necessarily the right way to build things overall. And so one of the things that you always wanna remember is that code is a liability. That code can at best do exactly what you intend it to do. Right, which is never true, there are always bugs. Right, so you can only lose points through coding. So you wanna do it as little as possible to accomplish your goal. The more code you own, the more opportunities you're giving yourself from departing from your intended values. And so because technology is the point, we should ask instead, how can we best deliver value? And the answer may not be directly what's easiest or most fun for us. Just because something is harder doesn't mean it's not more effectively accomplishing our goals. There's actually a recent study about education where active learning, uh, which is a much more sort of engaging the students method of, of teaching, was rated by students, they, they liked it less, and they judged themselves to be learning less even though they were learning more. And so introspection is key on this because the way you feel about it may not be the actual way that, uh, that it's working out when you zoom out. And so you wanna ask what biases, attachments, and beliefs have you built up that may be getting in the way of better delivering value. Because serverless is about minimalism, right? Letting go, removing distractions, owning less technology. Right, Marie Kondo, big now. And it's the same advice, right? Find the components of your stack that don't spark joy. <laughs> but it's not about joy for you, it's about joy for your organization. And part of this is that constraints are good, right? Removing options can help you focus. Now obviously not all constraints are good, but in general the ability to do anything comes at the cost of it taking longer to do one thing in particular. So like guardrails, 
rights um, may be annoying, but you can go faster than if you always had to watch the edge. You may, feel, you may not feel as good if you're bowling with bumpers, but you're going to get more pins down. <laughs> and so I like this, be afraid of the enormity of the possible. Because possibilities carry with them hidden complexity. And so when I'm evaluating a technology, one of the primary metrics that I choose from is how much capability it has beyond just what I'm applying it to. Because when there's a lot of extra space, there's unnecessary things that I have to learn about and be concerned with, right? So Kubernetes is a tool that people tout as one thing that will accomplish all of your cloud needs. And while that's true, it's capable of doing that, the key is that for any given task, Kubernetes can go wrong because you haven't accounted for ways in which it acts that are unrelated to that task. And the other thing is when you choose between a service, a managed service that's on your main provider, like within the ecosystem that you're already working, and a new provider that maybe has a service that accomplishes more of what you want, there are new complexities in that. What does the auth look like? What do the operations look like? Now, it may be justified, but you want to think about all the different factors that come in to bring that, that new provider in and trade that off against the features that you're getting. Remember that the best flywheels are not the lightest ones. They're not the heaviest ones. But hello world for any technology is almost never indicative of uh, how effective the technology is in the long run. So in serverless, we have a lot of infrastructure um, because we have a lot of managed services. And our applications are defined not by execution graph inside our code, but by our application graph in our infrastructure. Um, and a lot of that is merely connecting managed services to each other. Now, some places in there, you have to bring functions in. And hopefully, the places that you bring functions in are places where you need business logic where something, there isn't a service that's provided to do it because nobody does it but you. Of course, because it's not a perfect world, you need functions as glue between things that don't integrate well together. But always look for ways that you can remove functions. So in AWS, API Gateway is capable of integrating directly with services. And instead of doing you know, mapping in code that you're familiar with, you learn velocity templates, which are annoying. But once you figure out how to do that, all of a sudden you have something where there's no custom code that you've brought in, just configuration. And this gets to infrastructure as code is good, but what does code exactly mean? Because we talk about configuration as being the, the, uh, different from infrastructure as code. But I think that often gets confusing as there's configuration where you've gone into, you know, manually gone into a system through a console and configured things in a way that's not repeatable. Um, but YAML is code. And if you think about the things, YAML is a syntax for domain-specific languages, whether it's Kubernetes um, or, uh, or CloudFormation. And so it's important to remember that understanding your deployed infrastructure is critical in the long run. Right, I like this uh, tweet here, which is, how do you evaluate a technology, right? This is annoying, it's a new thing to learn. It may not hit, you know, I don't feel in the zone when I'm using it, but it saves me time. It saves my organization time and money. So it's useful. And once we're open to new things, server serverless providers can enable better managed experiences. And this is where sort of, I think, thinking of containers as the right solution ties us to owning a lot of things that are inside that container. The uh, language runtime, code from third parties, all of those, if you look at some of the, the models on some providers like Lambda, have ways of doing that where it's happening at the service level, not at the build level. Um, and I think that's a powerful way that we can enable uh, better managed systems in the future. It's important to accept the discomfort of not owning your own destiny. Um, when you're using a managed provider, outages are stressful because there's nothing you can do to fix it. Now you still have work to do to make sure that your system is responding as best it can to that outage, but it will always feel awful. And you'll think, oh, well, if I'm running a Kafka cluster instead of using Kinesis, well, I could go in and fix it. 
But again, it would be a distraction from what you're trying to accomplish. And you would almost certainly be worse at it because it's not what you do as your primary goal. It's a side business at that point. And that's a hard thing to do, but it's super critical to moving into, into serverless. So Jared Short provided a brilliant set of guidelines for choosing technology. Um, in order, if you're on a cloud platform, stay within the ecosystem. You remove so many possibilities that way. If you can't get what you need on the platform, buy it from somewhere else. But the really important one is that if you can reconsider your requirements to accomplish something that you can buy, do that first. Because what you're thinking about shipping, you're not sure that it's the right thing yet. So it's better to ship something close to it using fully managed services quicker than to spend a bunch of time building it that then you have to own it afterwards and it may not even be the right thing. Now, maybe you find that you do need to build something. Well, first, this is a funny uh, diagram, but uh, the, the point of you know, looking for trade-offs in your requirements so that you can build it faster is always something that you should do. But if you do build it, own it. So if it's something that you could not have built or you could not have bought in a perfect serverless world, greenfield implementation, then it's a differentiator because no one else has it. So fundamentally, you want to find your part of the business value, right? What is your technology work and service from? And you may be far removed from user-facing products. You may be only contributing a small slice of that value, but it's there and you can find it and you can focus on it. You can start with a value that you're immediately providing to other teams in the organization. Start to trace the value from there. And then make sure all the decisions you're, you're making are oriented around that value. That's making serverless choices. Uh, and so remembering that you're not the tool, um, automate the creation of value that you're doing so that you can move on to new and other value. Right? I like this quote, but you can turn it around too. Automate yourself out of a job and then just keep demanding new jobs. So to sum up, um, serverless is about focus. Right? Technology is not the point of what we're doing. The nature of development is changing, right? That we're tied less to the technologies that we're using and that we can move up the chain in value towards uh, what the business needs. Find your part of that business value and make serverless choices. So thank you. Um, we've got open rec. Please come see us at our booth. Um, we're out there uh, near the screen. Uh, and yeah, I think we're out of time. Sure, I'll, um, we're close to out of time. Thank you so much, Ben. Give us a round of applause.